This segment is about ion transporter in freshwater and saltwater marine fish. Uh, saltwater marine, in other words. So I'm going to start with a line to illustrate the inside versus the outside. And here's an epithelial cell outside to the left, inside to the right. And I'm going to start with freshwater. I'm exaggerating the spaces between these cells because I want to use them to show you what's going on a little bit later. So what happens on a freshwater fish in which freshwater is to the left over here? And the problem is that freshwater is low on ions, around one or a few milliosmoles for sodium chloride and other valuable ions. And so um, fish needs to somehow get those in. And what it does is it exchanges useless ions, protons and bicarbonate, for useless ones, sodium in this case. And that takes an ATP. It's moving these against a concentration gradient, higher sodium inside than out. And it has to do the same for chloride, but in this case it moves a bicarbonate in exchange for chloride. So this keeps the charges equal. So every one of these always keeps the charges equal in uh, both of these. The sodium then gets moved out by the sodium-potassium pump, moving three sodiums out for two potassiums in. The chloride can move out passively following that charge movement outside the sodium using a channel. Where does it get the protons and the bicarbonate? Well, remember it's generating those by carbon dioxide, which it combines with water using carbonic anhydrase. And the enzyme carbonic anhydrase catalyzes the reaction so that it would occur faster, but it actually occurs passively and doesn't require energy. That generates, uh, that generates H2CO3, which dissociates into an H plus and a bicarbonate. So the carbonic acid, H2CO3, H plus, and the carbonate, the H plus, gets used to bring sodiums in and the bicarbonate to neutralize, to keep the charge the same when you move chloride in. So that's for freshwater fish, and it's using analogous methods to bring in uh, other ions, um, though I admit I'm oversimplifying a bit. So in salt water, a marine fish has a different problem. Again, here's an epithelial layer, some cells, and a gap between the cells, because I'm going to use those in a bit. So the outside of the cell is high in sodium and chloride and other ions, but sodium and chloride are the two major ones, at around 100, uh, around 1,000 milliosmoles, whereas the inside of a teleost fish, a typical marine fish like a tuna, would have maybe in the range of 300 to 500 milliosmoles. So the tendency is for water to enter and excess of sodium and chloride to come in with the food. So a fish gets rid of that excess sodium and chloride with an NKCC sodium potassium chloride, NKCC, notice neutral charge, two, two pluses, two Cl minuses moving in. That's the NKCC transporter. It's driven by the sodium concentration gradient. So that's the first step in this. And of course, the sodium concentration gradient and the potassium concentration gradient need to be maintained. Potassium simply leaves through a channel, a potassium channel. The chloride, once it's pumped in, winds up in high concentration in the cell, and so it moves outside through channels to the outside. And of course, this whole thing, as I mentioned, is driven by sodium. And so the sodium concentration gradient has to be maintained by the sodium-potassium pump, three sodiums out, two potassiums in. So the potassium just keeps cycling, uh, moving in with these two mechanisms, and in both cases moving out. The sodium-potassium pump requires an ATP, and that's generating this secondary active transport, in this case for the NKCC transporter. Okay, so we've taken care of chloride, but what about the sodium? How do we move sodium out of this cell? That's what I need these clefts for. Sodium winds up in high concentration in these clefts and moves out through channels that allow sodium out. 
So the high concentration of sodium, again, higher than the um, concentration outside, and so sodium moves out 